So, you're ready to learn fertility awareness, but not sure where to start. I have cultivated several excellent resources for you, including my free online course, FAM 101. FAM 101 takes you through the basics of the fertility awareness method, and I walk you through what you need to know about the three main fertile signs, cervical mucus, basal body temperature, and cervical position. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101 to access this amazing resource today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101. This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. Learn fertility awareness from the comfort of your own home at your own pace for a fraction of the cost. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 272. Welcome to the 272nd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I've got a great episode for you today. Today, I'm sharing another installment of my Pill Reality series. And in today's episode, I'm interviewing Laura, and Laura used the implant and over the past, if for any of you who've, who's been following the series, I kind of throw these episodes in here and there. For the full series, if you want to hear all of the episodes in the series, you can head over to fertilityfriday.com slash pill reality. And so obviously it's not just the birth control pill, it's all types of birth control, including hormonal methods. I've interviewed women who've used the Mirena IUD, who've used, I'm trying to think if I've done the patch or the ring. I think so. And as well as, of course, the pill and the shot and even the copper IUD. So there's a number of episodes. If you're new to the podcast and uh, you enjoy today's episode, then definitely check out the previous episodes in the Pill Reality series. But in today's episode in particular, we're focusing on the implant and Laura shares her experience with it. And it's interesting because Laura used the pill and the implant. And so she had a different experience on the pill compared to the experience that she had on the implant. And so, you know, I appreciate all of the women who've participated in this series who have shared their experiences. I know I've heard feedback about these episodes because of course I'm showcasing women who've had different experiences, women who've come forward and said, okay, I had this experience, it was fairly negative or this experience with it, or this is what changed when I had it, you know, when I stopped using it or those types of things. I often hear feedback from women who say like, my experience was great, my experience was perfect. And one of the things I always like to say is that as women, we're not educated about the side effects associated with hormonal birth control. And there's really few women who I've ever spoken to in my entire life who were fully counseled about all of the possible side effects that are associated with hormonal birth control. You know, for many women, if you're taking hormonal birth control, you may not experience any of the egregious or obvious or the the types of side effects that many of the women will experience. I mean, if all of a sudden you start experiencing recurrent yeast infections or having you know, severe emotional mood swings, certain things that really grab your attention, then it's more likely that you're going to kind of be attuned to it. Experience has taught me that many women experience more of the subtle side effects. And ultimately, I've had a number of interviews with uh, with women over the years, a number of conversations with women over the years who didn't really experience anything that was jarring to them while they were taking hormonal birth control. But then when they came off of it, subtly and slowly certain things shifted so they they noticed an increase in their libido an increase in their energy just generally feeling different feeling more clear feeling more like a you know haze was lifted those types of things and so many women who report having a wonderful experience on the pill there's these you know potentially subtle things that are happening in the background that they may or may not be aware of obviously i'm not the most objective audience and i can own that It's, you know, especially given I've, you know, over the years, hundreds and hundreds of stories of women who've used birth control and just had different experiences. It's important to know that, you know, these are hormones. They're synthetic hormones. They're fake man-made hormones that we're putting into our body to think that we can put synthetic, fake, you know, man-made hormones into our body, hormones that either shut down ovulation or suppress ovulation or otherwise impact our endocrine system to think that we can put these hormones in our body with absolutely no effects. It's just not actually true. There's always some sort of effect. Really, the question is which effect and then whether or not you'll notice it. So with that said, 
If you are somewhere on your own fertility awareness journey, if you have used hormonal birth control before, if you are still using hormonal birth control and listening to today's episode to gather information about how it may you know, be affecting you, if you have kind of had a hunch that there might have been something that was happening, you know, that's part of the reason why I do these episodes because as women, many of us have these hunches, these, uh, you know, this kind of little voice in the background, like, oh, there might be something going on here, but we often ignore it. So I feel that by giving voice to to women to be able to share these experiences to really put them out there in our own words it can really help us to just to feel validated you know so that you know it's not just you if you happen to have a, a certain experience with a certain type of birth control i think it's really important to know it's not just you it's not in your head it is real and i mean ultimately the only way to kind of test it out especially if you're not quite sure would be either to switch to something different or to come off of it for a period of time and it's okay to do something like that you know you can actually do that you can go off of it for a period of time you can switch to a different formulation switch to a different type you have options you don't have to kind of suffer through anything really and if you're starting to contemplate fertility awareness as your primary birth control method, if that's something that you're thinking about, especially if you're in that space of, you know, thinking about coming off the pill and really just, you know, either terrified or really just unsure as to how you would possibly feel comfortable managing your fertility without it, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam 101. That's fertilityfriday.com slash FAM101 and grab my three-part video series that's absolutely free and it takes you through the basics of fertility awareness from cervical mucus to basal body temperature to cervical position. It's a great place to start. And also, if you haven't grabbed a copy of The Fifth Vital Sign, I released that book in January with over a thousand research citations. It is the most comprehensive resource available on fertility awareness and the connection between your menstrual cycle and your overall health. So The Fifth Vital Sign is available on Amazon in audiobook, ebook, and paperback formats. And you can also download the first chapter for free over at thefifthvitalsignbook.com. Now, with that said, let's jump into today's episode with Laura. And today I'm really excited to be here with Laura. Laura is a member of the Fertility Friday Facebook community. And just like I do with a lot of these sessions, we're often talking about different topics in there. And I did post something several weeks ago. Well, by the time this comes out, it might be several months ago, but I did post something about implants and what your, you know, if anyone had had experience with implants, because after quite a long time of focusing on just the pill, I thought maybe let's look at some of the other types of birth control. So Laura reached out to me because she had an experience with the implant that she wanted to share. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm glad that you're here with us. And maybe just to give us a sense of just your background, maybe let us know when you know, what your periods were like when you first started having them and essentially what your birth control history was like. So, you know, what, what type of birth control you started using in the beginning and also kind of leading us to your experience with the implant. Okay. Yeah. So I actually had to ask my mom when I started my period, cause I knew it was in middle school, but I could not remember when. So my first period was when I was about 13 years old. And then I did not have a second one for about another year. But then pretty much after that year mark, I had them fairly regularly. I remember using like period tracking apps, something really basic of just like the days. So I definitely remember them being about 28 days, maybe 30 at the most. So pretty regular and actually pretty light, pretty like easy maintenance periods. I don't know. So nothing too crazy. And birth control was never really on my mind until I went to college and I had my first serious relationship. So I started dating my boyfriend kind of the first semester towards the end. And then in early 2014 is when I was like, okay, you know, I think I need to do the responsible thing and start taking birth control. And as far as I knew, that was pretty much my only option. So I was like, yep, I'm a smart person. I'm going to do this. Um, I don't remember what birth control I took. I know it was a pill I took every day. My doctor was very chill in that she was like, yep, just so long as you take it roughly the same time every day, like there should be no worries. And it was the kind with a month and then a period. Because I know some people who just never even take the placebo, they just keep taking it. So I did that. So from 2014 
I took the same one the entire time when I took the pill. There was one point where it changed from the name brand to generic, but it was the same synthetic hormones. So I, yeah, let me think now. From there, I remember getting tired of taking a pill every day. And I was like, well, I need something else. Like this isn't quite working for me and trying, even though my doctor wasn't super strict that like it needs to be the same time. I was still just I went on one vacation trip to Colorado, didn't bring my birth control, was on my period in the mountains trying to climb a 14er, and I was like, okay, this isn't the best. So I definitely talked to my mom about it, um, about my options. My mom's a nurse, we're decently close, so I was like, hey, I am thinking of getting an IUD. And in her mind, she's like, that's very invasive, maybe the implant. And I've definitely, I've talked to people about it who they're both invasive. But in my mind at that point, I'm like, well, you're right. Like uterus versus arm. Arm is pretty like exposed, easy to get to. So I ended up going with that. I had talks with other women friends in college. So about birth control use. I remember I studied abroad with a group of Americans and I, one day we were all talking about different birth control methods and most everyone took the pill. One of the other girls, women had an IUD and one had the arm implant. And I had heard maybe about one or two other people who had had it too. So by the time I finally was like, okay, I think I do want to get either one or the other. I started messaging some friends or acquaintances who'd had it and I had heard of one woman who had a really bad experience and that she was just on her period constantly and had it taken out. The other two women I talked to were like, I loved it. I had it for the five years. I just got it. The other one in the other arm, like great reviews from her. And then the third woman I talked to didn't give me too many details, but she's like, yeah, like it works really well. I don't really get periods. And I was like, wow, no periods. Like, yeah, this is sounding better and better. So this was about 2016 by this time. And then I think January, oh no, wait, let's see. So early 2017, I, about January, I got the Nexplanon arm implant. And I know there's a couple different types, but I know that's the one I had. And I went to the OBGYN that I always go to and thought everything was great. I was like, okay, cool. I don't have to take a pill anymore. Like, this is awesome. So. Well, and can I just ask what your experience was like getting it inserted? Was it fine? Was it just like nothing? Or, you know, do you remember what it was like? I remember being a little nervous about it, but going in, they did a like local anesthetic, like cleaned it off and then um, a needle for the anesthetic and kind of just waiting think maybe five or 10 minutes for it to numb up. Then she asked me if I could feel pressure where she was poking, which is about trying to think almost closer to the tricep on my left arm on the inside of my bicep. And I was like, nope, can't feel it. So she inserted it. Don't really remember how long that actual part took. And then I remember she wrapped it up really tight, like my entire upper arm, because that is what was going to hold it in the fat, I'm pretty sure is where she said it was inserted. And it wasn't the most comfortable experience, but I didn't have a terrible like time with it. I was like, okay, like, there we go. It's in now. Like, let's see how this goes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, it's interesting just in the general sense, because you did get an anesthetic, right? So they were taking care of the pain. And I've interviewed a number of women and I've recently released a number of episodes regarding the IUD and it's like, there's no, <laughs> there's no pain relief and everything. And it's just, I, I'm just, I, I have all these thoughts swarming in my head because you mentioned the conversation with your mom and it was like, the arm is less invasive than the uterus, but at least with the arm you get an <laughs> anesthetic. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. That's also what deterred me from the IUD was I had talked to, I talked to some women about it and a couple were like, yeah, my, well, basically their body was trying to like reject it. So they felt like they were, they'd never been in labor, but they're like, it was like labor cramps, like labor contractions, something like the uterus was not happy. So that was another like factor in my decision to get the arm implant. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And so you had it 
inserted then and it went pretty well. It wasn't the most comfortable, but it was, it wasn't a big deal really by the sounds of it. And so then how did it all play out? Yeah. So I can't remember how long it took to heal, maybe two weeks for it to completely, there was just a really small circle, maybe the size if you'd like drew a dot with the Sharpie, that was a scab from the insertion. And I would kind of touch the skin underneath. You could feel it. It's like a, it's plastic about the length of a matchstick and you could feel it rolling around. I didn't really mess with it much. And once it was healed, I could just kind of poke at it, but I almost never really even realized that it was there. And then period wise, I had a little bit of spotting, I think right as it was inserted. And then I stopped having any periods. So in my mind, I was like, yeah, like, this is great. Like, I get to be away from this giant inconvenience. And I laugh at that now when I think about it because of how, like, my mindset has changed 180 about all of this. But at the time, that was definitely my, like, thoughts. I was like, cool. I don't have to deal with this, like, giant inconvenience of my life. And I pretty much thought, I was like, yeah, this is all totally fine. I journal a lot, at least I try to at least once a week and I kind of write what's happening in my life. So at this time I was in university, I was in my going junior to senior year and I was very stressed. So a lot of my entries are about being stressed, but looking back now, I see this very clear like timeline of getting it inserted and then the entries talking about my emotions. So I got very like intense emotions in the ways that I could not, I felt like I was out of control. Not, I wasn't angry or anything. I would be really stressed and I don't know, drop a pencil on the ground and be like in tears sobbing in a way where I was like, oh my gosh, like I literally did not choose to start crying right now, but I'm crying and I am so worked up and things led up to it. And I'm sure at least part of it was just being stressed of being in school. But I see these like repeated incidents of usually just like getting into these like crying fits in a way where I'm like, is, I never cried in front of anyone. So it wasn't like embarrassing, but reading back, I'm like, I at first was like, oh, like, I'm just stressed. And then there was an entry where I, when I read it, I'm like, okay, not going to call my past self dumb, but I was like, that's kind of dumb or something. Like I should have seen this sign because I read the entry and I was like, you know, I think it might be a side effect of getting the arm implant, but oh, well, like I have to deal with this. And at that point in that entry, I was like, oh, nothing I can do. And looking back, I'm like, so that was, was that what you wrote in the entry? Like this could be a side, like is, when you read back the words, were you actually saying that? You know, I, you? Yes, I explicitly wrote like, <laughs> I think this is a side effect of changing birth control. And then the next sentence was like, but oh well, I'll just have to find a way to deal with it. As in, I can't like change anything about my birth control because that's, that's just what I have to live with. That's interesting. Yeah, that would be interesting. Like, did you, I don't know, when you read that, what, uh, did you remember writing that specific thing? Or was it kind of like one of those you went back and you were like, oh my gosh, I, I actually knew this? I think looking back, I'm like, I remember realizing that it was the arm implant. And I remember being like, no, like, can't do anything about it. Hmm. So, hmm. Mm-hmm. well, it's interesting in your case having having journaled about it and being able to go back and see yeah because not every I mean not everyone actually has that kind of record but in your case you have this this actual record and you can kind of see what it changed so you've talked a little bit about what changed but share with us just a little bit more about you know what changed emotionally was it mostly the the crying and emotional upwards or was it there more of a shift than other than that I'm trying to think. So in high school, before I went to college, I dealt with like some anxiety and depression that I never 
got treated like by taking any medications, I did go see a therapist and that helped and I didn't actually go for very long. So kind of right as I left high school and entered college, being in that new atmosphere, at least for the depression side of things, that eased up quite significantly. So I did not have like overlying emotions of like depression, but for anxiety, I'm still a somewhat anxious person, but I've gotten a lot better at managing it. I would be, the hard thing is, is like stress has so many like outlets of how it like is portrayed at least for me, like when I'm stressed, it can be displayed in a lot of ways. So like being snippy or like crying at something or just the physical tension in my body. So I would say looking back when I started or once I got the implant, the things that I'd already been feeling of like stress from school, anxiety about, I don't know, lots of things pretty generalized the intensity increased. So that did underlying kind of stick, like it sticks out in my mind now looking back, seeing that I got the arm implant. And I would say this was about three months in that that journal entry happened because I had it um, in my arm for about eight months total. So three months in, I had the one journal entry that was like, you know, this might be from my birth control. But the emotions themselves were It was the fact that when they occurred, sometimes it would be like, I'd be very happy about something, but they happened to such extremes. So I would be like, oh, like I'm having a great day, blah, blah, blah. And I would feel like ecstatic. And then maybe an hour later, like something would happen and I'd be like pretty low again. And not in a way that I would imagine like someone who's bipolar is, but in a way that for me, I knew this wasn't normal. Like this is not baseline what I should be feeling and like I at least was able to identify that that wasn't right for me well and you had been on hormonal birth control before so you had been taking you had taken the the pill for you said it was about something like two to three years ish it sounded like two years I'd say maybe even a year and a half before I switched to the arm implant Okay. And so it was like, what it sounds like was that there was this obvious, like the arm implant obviously affected you in a really different way. Looking back, did you, because you didn't mention any issues that you had on the pill, like looking back, did you notice anything or was your experience on the pill a fairly even keel? Looking back, especially compared to the arm implant, it wasn't to the level of where I noticed it. If I really think about it, I do think that even taking the pill kind of made my emotions a little bit less stable in a way, but it was the arm implant that is what, like that was the kicker for me of like what made me finally realize that this is what's doing it. And then it wasn't until I met a group of women who none of them took hormonal birth control and one of them even had used FAM for a while and then no longer did. I didn't ever really ask her specifically why, but it, like it, I changed the context of the group of people I was around and that's what made me realize that it wasn't normal and it wasn't a thing that I had to deal with from changing like birth controls or even taking any hormonal birth control. Well, yeah, that's, so you mentioned that you had the, so it was like three months before you had that journal entry. So you were having that realization that there was something different and that it could be related. And then you mentioned you took it for, or you had it in for about, you said nine months? Mm-hmm. Eight to nine. Yeah. And so just share with us what happened then between the three month mark and the eight to nine month mark. When you, I, I suppose it would be when you finally decided that you didn't want it anymore. And that was, that was enough did it like did it get worse or did it just kind of stay the same or what eventually got you to to have it out yeah so i feel like i've jumped around a bit so when i talked to the women who had taken hormonal birth control that was about fall of 2016 so i'd already been taking the pill for i guess a couple of years then then i talked to them got the implant and then the spring slash summer of 2017 I had a chance, I got grant money to go to Chile to volunteer at a national park. And 
I studied Spanish and environmental science in school. So it was this perfect opportunity to kind of combine both. And I was like speaking Spanish the whole time to all of these women because none of them spoke English. And it was really amazing. So when I mentioned that I met new people who did not use hormonal birth control, that was when I was down in Chile. And so I was, it was one of like the best experiences in my life for many reasons, but looking back specifically to period health, that was a huge factor to how I like viewed everything because I was living with these four to five women, mostly four in a really isolated area where we basically just had each other and no internet and no cell service <laughs> for about 14 days at a time. And then we'd get breaks to go back to civilization. So meeting them, one in particular, her name is Karen. She's very into women's health and she would teach younger women in the town slash village she was from like about gynecological health. And she had all these resources that she has since sent me in Spanish. And it's like, books about just pretty much everything period related. So I went from the context of people who the norm was hormonal birth control, like that's responsible, that's what you do, that's how you deal with periods, to kind of getting my eyes opened to fam and (laughs) everything about it. And before I went to Chile, I had read some things about fertility awareness and non-hormonal methods and kind of thinking right at first thinking like, well, that can't be a thing. And then I was reading a little bit into it more and more as I, I realized that my side effects weren't normal, or at least what I want, <laughs> they weren't what I wanted to deal with or live with. So I kind of had that slight background before going to Chile, but Chile is where I just learned so much about women's health and periods. So I was in Chile from about March to August of 2017. September to December of that year was my last semester of college. So by the time I come back from Chile, I'm kind of versed in like what fertility awareness is. And I had read more about it on my own. I had found your website and all of your resources. I had read Taking Charge of Your Fertility. I was starting to be very aware that there was a method that I could use that would not have these side effects and that it was reliable, like realistic for me to do and something that I wanted to do. So in a period of like four to five months, I completely shifted my view of what I thought was like responsible birth control for me. So I go back to school or I went back to school in my last semester. So in September and by October, actually I had a journal entry from the day I got removed. So October 5th, 2017, I went and got the next Planon removed. My roommate at the time, I I told her about FAM and she was also very supportive. So she went with me to get it taken out. I went to a different clinic than I normally go to because the university I went to is in a different city. So I went to the clinic, they took it out. And if you want me to talk about that experience, getting it out was quite a bit worse than getting it inserted. Oh. Well, yeah, maybe just share with us because I did one of the, uh, I did an interview with another woman. I'm not sure how close I'll release all of these about the implant, and it was like it, it had moved, and so it was a lot harder. I don't know. So maybe share with us what happened in your case when you went to get it removed. Yeah, it did. It it hadn't moved. So I went into the clinic and it was the same thing of them locally numbing it and then the needle. There was a student assistant nurse, someone learning how to, I don't know what their position was, but someone that was in there to watch the procedure be done. And the woman kind of felt it first before she numbed it. And she's like, okay, that's where it is. That's where the end will be. There was a scar so from the insertion. So she had a good idea of where to go. So yeah, then it was numbed and it wasn't, horrible that like she couldn't find her anything but listening to the sound of her scratching through the scar tissue was very disconcerting to me and it took about 10 minutes so the insertion I would say took less than a minute of like actual putting it under the skin and making sure it was in the right spot 
taking it out, she was scratching a little and then pushing on one side so that it would kind of stick up on the other end of my skin, trying to poke it through the hole she had just cut into my arm. Mm. Um, And then it wouldn't go because of the scar tissue that had formed around it. And she'd scratch a little more, push a little more. And even though I couldn't feel it, I could hear it. So it's kind of like going to the dentist where you can hear them doing stuff in your (laughs) mouth, even if you can't feel it. So it was just a lot harder. And especially since by this point I had formed all of my own opinions on like what I thought I should be doing with my body. So I was very relieved to get it out, but the process of it, of like listening to the scar tissue. And then eventually when it did poke out, like she poked it out and it just slid out. And I was like, Ugh, I can't believe I had put this piece of plastic with fake hormones in my arm thinking this was no big deal. And then getting it out was I guess, compared to it moving, an easy process, but it was not pleasant. And then they did the same thing of um, wrapping it up tight, and then I left. (laughs) Hmm. Well, it sounds like it wasn't painful, but it was more just the whole experience of it and feeling it and hearing it. And I think it's interesting, too, because you had it for about eight or nine months, and, you know, the scar tissue and all that. So I would wonder what it would be like to get it out after five years. Mm -hmm. I had the same thought when it came out for how she made a couple of comments on how she's like, Oh, it's it's not coming out. Like, Oh, and she's like, I don't want to cut the hole bigger. And I was like, Oh, okay. (laughs) So that definitely made me wonder what it's like for other women getting it out after that much time. Cause I'd had it for less than a year. Well, and I'll just, it just, it, I've, there have been some really interesting conversations in the Facebook community as of late. And I, at this point, when I release this episode, I may or may not have released an episode addressing some of those. But it's interesting what we, as women, what we will go, like what we'll do just without even thinking about it. Because we, it's, it's so ingrained to us to have the complete responsibility of preventing pregnancy on our shoulders. And so it's almost like there's nothing we won't do. And when you're sharing your experience and just like, it's like we, it's exactly what you said when you had it in, you had the mindset of like, this is no big deal. Great. I get to stop having periods and you know, they're just putting it in my arm. That's like super non-invasive. It's just, it's just interesting because I'm really resonating just with your experience of, you know, basically meeting a different friend group (laughs) who is speaking about the menstrual cycle as being important and periods in a different way and hormones as having effects on your body that you might not want and how that shift in your mindset really changed how you looked at the whole concept of putting something in your body. And I think that that is the point that is really interesting to me. That's kind of like the point, even from starting this podcast and airing all these stories, because most of us just don't think anything of it because this is the culture that we're in the culture of like just go on birth control and that's totally fine and you don't get your period and you know it'll get rid of your cramps it'll fix your skin and we just have this idea that it's just like taking a multivitamin or something and it doesn't have any effect and we're willing to put our bodies through all kinds of stuff without even thinking of it so so yeah so then after you had it out share with us how you like what you did because obviously you still needed birth control so how did you manage this see this is like this wonderful metamorphosis but we still have the practical aspect of like okay but i'm still not trying to get pregnant right now yeah and i'm definitely like in the time of my life where i'm like i do not want to have any kids so deciding to get it out part of what made me take so long which i view it as so long but really wasn't that long but to stop taking any hormones and trusting that I was capable of using fertility awareness like going from like that jump that's why I took so long to come off of it because I was like okay I'm not going to have kids right now what do I need to do so the steps that I took I like I said I read taking charge of your fertility I found a few different resources online. I found a couple of people who spoke about fertility awareness and YouTube videos. I definitely, I'm a very, I like to read things and like see like 
the scientific background of things. So I studied science in school. I was very much like, I need to know that this works and not just take it from word of mouth. So I read books, read a couple of papers, but mostly read books that referenced papers. And I was like, okay, like I see the logic of how this works and how it could help me prevent pregnancy. So I got the arm implant out and I had bought a cheap basal body thermometer from Meyer <laughs> and started taking my temperatures. I took a couple practice ones and I actually, this is something I am excited to share. So the very first temperature I took, I still had the arm implant in, but I was just like, I just want to practice the getting into the habit of waking up and taking my temperature. So I took it and it was a lower number, like 97.0 Fahrenheit. And I was, my mind was blown that I was like, whoa, my resting body temperature is low. <laughs> and now that I've done it for over a year and a half, I'm like, yeah, like resting, it's lower, but just hearing and reading about it versus seeing on my thermometer that my temperature was low made me immensely more confident that what I was going to do was going to work. So I would say I took my temperature for maybe two to three weeks before getting the arm implant out. And then as soon as I did, I started charting just on paper and using the Kandara app. I liked having both to look back on. And I, yeah, since then have been charting my cycles, taking my temperature every morning. And it has worked quite well for me. I didn't get any professional instruction. And I would say about four months in, I listened to your episode about technology and um, fertility awareness. So I got the daisy and I've been using that since, but I, I still chart every day. I like use them in conjunction with one another. So, and my health insurance covered the daisy. So I was like, okay, this will make me feel extra confident that what I'm doing like is accurate and it was kind of like a backup system for what I wanted to prevent pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you took all the steps, right? Like you did the research ahead of time so that you'd feel comfortable with it. Cause of course there's stages. It's like, you can understand it on a mental level, but you actually have to <laughs> do the, do the actual charting so that you can understand it in a practical way. And give yourself the time to, to start to see those changes and shifts so that you can start to feel more confident about the method. So it sounds like you really took the steps to ease yourself into it, which is important. And lo and behold, year, you know, year and a half later, it sounds like you didn't have an unplanned pregnancy. So yeah. <laughs> yep. And I will say too, when I got the implant removed, it was relatively recently after a breakup. So it was a point in my life where I was like, you know, I'm probably not going to have a partner <laughs> where I have the chance of getting pregnant for at least a few months. So for me, that was the perfect time to finally commit and start. Though I, I do think that even if I had still been dating um, someone at that time, I would have gotten it removed because I had reached a threshold for me where I was like this especially because my entire mindset had changed about my menstrual cycle. I was like, this is not okay that I am not in control of my emotions, that I'm not menstruating, which some people I'm sure will hear that and be like, that still sounds quite pleasant, especially like just considering that the society we live in basically is like menstruating is not great, not ideal. Like we should not, like we have tools not to do it. So don't do it. But like having my mindset change and then realizing that I didn't have to deal with the fact that my emotions were out of control, which I feel like offhandedly to some people may sound like not a big deal, but it was controlling my entire like life. Maybe not controlling it, but it was influencing it in that I was like, I am not in control of my emotions. And well, what you said at the towards the beginning of our call together was that you had an experience or experiences of something would happen and then you would start to cry and you would have that thought of, I'm not 
actually the one in control. Like I'm crying, but I didn't make that decision. I thought that was an interesting thing that you said. And also it's on, it sounded like when you described it, it's, it sounded like someone, you know, if you ever see that, like, how am I, let me try to explain what I'm trying to say, but it's like, it sounded as though you were kind of watching this happen and almost having like that out of body, like what's going on? But I don't know. You tell me if that's right on, but that's kind of how it sounded when you described it. Yeah, no, that's very accurate because especially I feel like if, especially if a female cries, it's like, oh, she's on her period or she's just hormonal. And I truly was though. (laughs) So it's kind of funny, but not because it was in a way that I was like, oh my goodness. Like, how did I go from here to here from nothing and consistently doing that like week after week and making the connection of what I thought it was. And now, especially I can say that I got the implant removed. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I, I don't take any other medications and I wasn't at the time. So I started taking a new medication, had these effects, got it taken out no longer have the effects and I feel much clearer is how I would describe it. Well, and I suppose I should, so you mentioned it, but I should ask the question of, so after you took it out, did you have any of those? So did you either, did you have any of those, you know, emotional outbursts or experiences or did you actually notice a change? Yeah, I noticed a change almost immediately and I'm not sure if it was placebo from, having the expectation of, oh, this is what's causing it. I'm going to get it removed. But I feel like it was a little bit of both, but mostly I feel that it was, I like my body got to start making its own hormones again. (laughs) And that's something that I value now quite a bit. And it was definitely noticeable. So I got the implant out within a month or maybe two months out one day. I don't know if there was one specific day, but like, going to back to like journal entries or something, I had such a sense of relief of, I don't even want, I don't want to say being me because that sounds cliche, but like truly like being me and being in tune with what's going on in my body and realizing like, this is the only body that I'm going to inhabit and live in. So like letting it be its own thing and then experiencing that in such a positive way of like, Oh, I'm not going to cry because I dropped a pencil on the ground. That did happen once, like before when I was on it. Like it, it truly was a pencil falling on the ground that made me be like just over in that moment. And then to now where I feel very, I like the word clear. I don't know if that would make sense to someone who hasn't had the experience, but that's what I feel describes it really well. Yeah. It's, and see when, because this, you know, what you're describing to me, this isn't the first time I've heard a story this, like, I mean, part of it is that I do this series, and I've spoken to a number of women within the context of the podcast, but I'm also a woman, and I have a life outside of the podcast, and I have a lot of women friends, and I also went to college, and I had a lot of friends in college who also took hormonal birth control, and so what you're explaining to me is something I've heard over and over and over and over again over the course of my life, which is why I do this. I do this because I know that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of women who have experiences like this. And as women, we often, we often keep those types of experiences to ourselves, or we often kind of question it. Unless you have, in your case, you ended up connecting with a group of women who showed you a different way and that resonated with you and that helped you to seek other alternatives you know, one of the questions would be, what if you hadn't, (laughs) what if you hadn't gone to Chile? (laughs) And what if you hadn't had that experience? And so through conversations like this, I think you and I both hope to give other women the opportunity to have that experience of, of women kind of bringing you into the collective and saying, look, it doesn't have to be this way. It is a big deal for you to have your emotion shift. One of my earliest experiences just as a, as a, basically as a bystander. So it wasn't my personal experience because I wasn't taking hormonal birth control in college. But one of my experiences, a really close friend of mine basically described what you described when she went on the pill. I mean, it was like one minute she was crying, the next minute she was pissed off. And it was, 
like within days of her going on this pill and and then it all stopped when she came off of it and in your case the pill was fine but the implant did it so it's it's interesting because everything doesn't affect everyone in the same way but yeah I don't even know how to characterize how it feels to continue to hear basically the same words so if it means anything for you to hear that that I have heard the similar words time and time again. Nothing you're saying sounds silly. It all sounds basically consistent. <laughs> and I get, I do get women reaching out to me saying, my experience on the pill was totally fine. I always say this. And different pills affect different women in different ways. And so not everyone experiences that. But I think it really is important for us to put this kind of stuff out there. Because a lot like it, you know. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure and you did your research before you had it in you had spoken to a number of women to like we all do you did your research you mentioned that you have that sciencey brain <laughs> which I can relate to and you did speak to somebody who had a negative experience who had the, the continual bleeding and, and things like that so just as I suppose as we start to wrap up like what for someone who's listening who had a wonderful experience with the, the implant or their birth control or, and or the woman who didn't have a good experience, what would you want them to know? I almost want to address it as what would I want myself to know? Because I did have a good and a bad experience on hormonal birth control. So where I am now is like, I would love for myself to have known that synthetic hormones are not real hormones and they do not affect your body the same way. I guess I feel like most women know that when they take the pill or whatever they take, that there's a risk for side effects, especially like really intense ones and even more what people would consider minor ones. But I feel like most women, when they hear that, like, okay, well, it probably won't happen to me or I don't have any other option. Like, I guess I'll just learn to deal with it. So I'd love to tell my past self to be like, hey, there is another option and another way to at least consider doing and living your life for having effective birth control that will not cause any side effects. Like it's pretty much a guarantee that if you you don't take hormones, you're not going to have any side effects, (laughs) which uh, sounds almost silly to me now, but I would love to have heard that however many years ago that was four or five years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. That reminds me of one of my interviews with Dr. Marguerite Duane. I'm pretty sure it was an interview, unless it was one of our conversations, but I think it was in an interview when she was describing how, you know, she went through med school (laughs) and the whole time never heard about fertility awareness, which is very common, obviously. Mm -hmm. And when she discovered it, she, you know, so I'll have to try to find the interview, but this is what I remember from it. So I apologize if it's not exactly accurate. There have been over 250 episodes. So, you know, I tried my best, but the way that she described it, it stuck with me because it was like, she was talking to one of her, you know, doctor buddies. And it was like, I discovered a type of birth control that doesn't have any side effects. And her friend is like, they all have side effects, honey. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. And so that's exactly, that's why it reminded me of what you're saying. Cause it's like, actually <laughs> there is birth control without side effects. Not necessarily for every woman, but we should all at least know that it's on the table, that it is effective and that it doesn't have side effects so that you can make the decision. Is it for you or not? You know, does charting, does charting seem like something you'd want to be doing? Because for a lot of us, the answer is yes. And we want to have that option. So, Mm -hmm. so yeah, so I love that. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Laura, for being here and for sharing your story so openly and honestly and candidly. I know that these episodes, I love doing them. I love sharing just the real, raw, honest experiences of women with birth control. And I think it's really important to give, to hold space and to provide, (laughs) to provide a microphone, essentially like a megaphone for you to talk about it so that as women, we can just sit back and, and learn about what this really looks like. Because a lot of us find ourselves in, you know, our doctor's offices and we're given prescriptions but we're never really told how it could affect our lives in a very literal sense. And then when it does start to, at least in your case, you made that connection fairly quickly. And when I hear stories like yours, where you did make that connection really quickly, it's often because the side effects are so obvious and dramatic that you couldn't not make that connection. 
And it's almost like a blessing in disguise. Having <laughs> ridiculously obvious side effects right off the bat can be a blessing because then you, at least you know. Whereas I spoke to other women who started having side effects three years in, eight years in. And that makes it a lot harder for them to make those connections. So silver lining, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say so. Like, I'm definitely glad I was able to find all the resources I did when I did. And the I think the friend group is, was the huge factor in me being like, okay, this is not something stupid or frivolous to do. This is actually very smart and what I feel is best for me right now. So definitely a silver lining. Yes, yes. Well, thank you again for being here. It was uh, just really great to be able to chat with you about this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 272. I hope that you enjoyed today's episodes with Laura. It was really just refreshing to have this conversation with her and to hear her experience. There was so many different pieces of it that I really appreciated. I feel like by listening to this episode, you can tell that, you know, Laura has thought a lot about this. And even when she described her experience of just, you know, journaling, many of us journal, but having that record of how she, you know, felt and reacted and responded and emoted to things prior to using the implant and then you know having that experience of actually having it written down of how she was feeling during that time and then afterwards I feel like it really helped her to reflect on these things and to come to the you know the conclusions herself about what was happening as well as for us to just hear her story and to really you know see those differences these episodes as much as they, I'm sure, come off as complete pill bashing, I really feel like it's more of just shedding light and being very clear about the reality of these types of hormones. So I think the message, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, is that we have to know that these, first of all, they're medications. Many of us don't even think of the pill as a medication. If you're taking hormonal birth control and someone asks you, you know, if you're on any medication, many of us don't even identify that it is an actual drug. In my, the interview that always comes to mind in my interview with Miranda Naylor, and I spoke about that interview in The Fifth Vital Sign in Chapter 18, where I was talking about how to choose your medical provider and shedding some light as to just the education that doctors have around non-hormonal birth control methods, particularly fertility awareness, and why they're often not the ones uh, recommending these types of methods, and also why hormonal birth control is kind of basically the solution, quote unquote, to all things menstrual related, all problems. In that interview, as a medical doctor herself, you know, she mentioned that she never really thought of the pill as a drug, even though she was a doctor, she kind of thought of it as like a vitamin or a supplement. Those, uh, if I remember correctly, that's how she described, you know, how she felt about it at the time. And so having episodes like this in the pill reality series, I feel like it's really important. Like we have to understand that these are hormones, they're synthetic hormones, and you can't take synthetic hormones without having some sort of impact on your body. And in order for the, the pill to work, I always take it back to kind of the basics. Like we have to know how the pill works in our bodies in order to appreciate how it's possible for different hormonal birth control methods to have the impacts that they do on us emotionally and, and all those types of things. And so in order for hormonal birth control to work, there's three main modes of action. One, most versions of hormonal birth control either completely suppress ovulation partially suppress it or at least interfere with the natural ovulatory cycle. So there are some versions of, you know, hormonal birth control that don't fully suppress ovulation all the time. But when you look at what the research says, it does disrupt ovulation on some level or disrupt the hormonal profile. And ultimately, it has to do that because if, if hormonal birth control didn't suppress or at least partially suppress or mostly suppress ovulation, it wouldn't work. <laughs> when you are not ovulating, you can't get pregnant. And that's one of the reasons why it works. I think that the key is understanding that when you suppress ovulation, it's not like it's just nothing else happens. You can't just ovulation is how we produce our main ovarian hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So when you suppress ovulation, you are messing with your hormonal cycle, your hormonal profile, and that has effects on various parts of our, not just our physical body or ability to have children, but on our emotions, on our moods, on our energy levels, just a multi multitude of impacts. 
so yeah, I mentioned three main ways. One is suppressing ovulation, either fully or partially. One is um, making the endometrial lining too thin. And when you look at research on how the implant impacts the endometrial lining, women who have the implant, the endometrial lining is very, very thin, too thin, theoretically speaking, to support pregnancy. And so that's one of the main modes of action as well. And also hormonal birth control prevents your cervix from producing fertile quality cervical mucus. So basically it creates a barrier to sperm, thick mucus plug in your cervix. So sperm can't even make its way through the uterus to even get, even if there was an egg to even get there. So those are the three main modes of action. So I think it's helpful to just talk about it. This is trying to, you know, we're trying to bring it into the light. We have to have conversations like this because even though every single woman who takes hormonal birth control doesn't necessarily experience to her knowledge, doesn't necessarily feel emotional changes or depressive symptoms or, you know, painful sex or low libido, you know, if, if she doesn't perceive those types of challenges, it's important to know that some women do. And the reason I do this series is to validate that because I've had, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with women where it's like, you know, they might've just internalized whatever was going on because they had no idea that it could have been caused by it because no one ever told them it could be caused by it. We have to tell each other about these things so that we all know, (laughs) so that if you ever take it, then you know what to look for, right? It's not about saying no one should ever take hormonal birth control, but it's more like, okay, if you take it, we gotta know that there's these things that could happen. And if they happen, then at least you know that it could be related and it gives you the opportunity to switch to something different, try out something new, you know, come off of it for a while, go back on it, whatever you need to do, but at least it gives you that information so that you can make these informed choices because ultimately that's what it's about. At this stage, maybe at some point I won't feel the need to justify it anymore. I just know that I get comments and I get feedback around these episodes because of that. I'm not anti-pill. I'm not like no one should ever use it. I'm not the type of person who's going to try to restrict access because I believe that we have the right to have access to all of the different alternatives. But we also have the, the right to access the information about how these things can affect us. So in the same way, if I had to take some sort of medication for some sort of illness, I would want to know exactly what it could be doing so that I would know, you know, if I experienced some side effects, it wouldn't catch me off guard, you know, and especially if they could be mood related, you know, I think that especially because if it's mood related, like you're in the mood, like you're if you're you're experiencing anxiety or depression or something like that, like you're in that mood. (laughs) So no one tells you it could be related to the drug you're taking. You just think you're feeling sad for another reason. It could take years for you to put the pieces together. So, so yeah, this is my attempt to give everyone the heads up. Like, these things could happen. You should know about it. So thank you so much, Laura, for coming on the show and sharing your experience. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I think I like the way you think. I I kind of relate to that. Like, you have just a very thoughtful way about looking at these things. You were able to, to kind of share with us very specifically how the the, you know your moods changed and everything because you were very aware of that because you were journaling and you were um, in many ways very in tune with what was happening because of that and so we all thank you (laughs) for sharing your experience with us today one of the questions that i get a lot in my facebook group fertilityfriday.com slash community if you want to join us in there is often from women who are currently on the pill who are just absolutely terrified of coming off of it so i've come to realize that There's a lot of fear associated with it. Fear of losing control, obviously fear of having an unplanned pregnancy, and essentially just the fear that your fertility is so kind of uncontrollable. You know, based on all the myths that we've been taught about our bodies, that the myth that we can get pregnant every single day, that from, you know, if you ever have sex with someone, you're definitely gonna get pregnant. All of those myths that we carry around with us all the time make us really fearful of our own fertility and fearful that there's no other way to control it. In one of my recent episodes, when I basically called men out for their role in unplanned pregnancies, it's also the way the culture is where the responsibility, the expectation is that as as women, we're going to be the ones who are responsible for this. And so when, you know, you're not on some sort of hormone that basically makes your body insensitive to sperm. So if you don't modify your physical body, then you're basically susceptible, you know, to pregnancy. And that can be really scary because then it involves having these conversations with our partners and having to 
kind of put them on notice that you're going to have to do stuff too here. You're going to have to modify your behavior. So it's a really scary conversation. If you are somewhere in that stage of contemplating what you're going to do, <laughs> if you're thinking about transitioning to fertility awareness and you're kind of unsure how this is going to work and even how you could use it without being terrified all the time of possibly conceiving, one thing I want you to know is that fertility awareness is highly effective when you use it correctly. There's multiple different fertility awareness based methods and essentially my biggest suggestion for you when you're wanting to use it is to choose a method, take the time to become educated in it, ideally work with an instructor so that you can hash out all of your questions and become very, very clear exactly you know which days are fertile which days are not what are the rules how do i know what if my cycles aren't perfect what if i'm coming off the pill and i have some irregularities how do i manage all of that that's how you feel confident that's how you gain confidence and also just know that there are you know hundreds of thousands of women out, out there that have successfully used fertility awareness you know myself included i've used fertility awareness for the past nearly 20 years i think i'm like in my 18th year or something like that with no unplanned pregnancies because I learned a specific method, I learned to use it correctly, I worked with certified instructors, and obviously I'm a teacher now, you know, have a detailed understanding of the method, but at the same time, it is possible. That's what I want you to know. I want you to know it's possible. And so I want to personally invite you to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery. This is my 10-week group coaching program where I take you through fertility awareness charting. We go through all of the basics we really get into cervical mucus charting, basal body temperature charting, and cervical position charting. And what I found over the years is whether you are starting from absolutely no charting experience whatsoever, or whether you have been charting for quite some time. I've had a number of women go through the program who've been charting their cycles for you know, a year or more. Wherever you are at, you will learn something new and you will come out of the program feeling much more comfortable and confident charting your cycles. And within in this program whether you are actively avoiding pregnancy so if you're in that stage of coming off the pill and wanting to be very very comfortable and confident so that you don't have to worry all the time that you might have an unplanned pregnancy or whether you are actively trying to conceive and you're wanting to make sure that you're timing correctly and you also want to gain additional insight into what if anything could be preventing conception, especially if you've been trying for a while. So wherever you fall on that spectrum, you are welcome to join us. Our next group program is starting on October 1st. So although it's in the middle of August right now, and it feels like that's a long ways away, it's going to be upon us <laughs> very, very soon. Early bird pricing is available until the end of August. If you're wanting to join us, I would encourage you to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program. That's fertilityfriday.com slash group program and secure your spot. We would love to have you in there. And so with that being said, I want to thank you for taking some time out of your busy summer day if you're listening in real time to join us i appreciate all of you for supporting the show for spreading the word i am recording this today in my backyard it is a beautiful sunny day so i hope you're enjoying some summer sun as well but i think my neighbor is about to start mowing the grass so i'm going to wrap this up thank you so much for being with us today and of course as always until next time be well and happy charting